Hi, good evening. Today I will talking about on how important it is to understand clouds and precipitation over the Southern Ocean to improve both our climate and model predictions. So probably by now you guys have already heard about how important it is to reduce our CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere because we need to limit the global warming maximum to two degrees. And the reason why we know this is because of climate models. So imagine climate models as a bunch of equations that they will represent the atmosphere, the ocean, the ice cover areas, the land areas, and all the interactions between them. The good thing is that we don't rely only on one model, we use a bunch of models, and this is what we call the SEMIP models. So the before last version, that is the SEMIP 5, they did some comparisons between the measurements and they found out that we have radiation biases. This means that actually the models are representing more incoming solar radiation to the surface than what actually we, we have. And this can be translated into having a warmer Southern Ocean, as we can see here. So the Southern Ocean is important because basically in this area we have CO2 uptake from the ocean to be stored in depth in the ocean. And this will help us to store the excess of a heat that we have. And also all that information can be transported to other latitudes. But you guys might be wondering how something that is so far south can be affect an area, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere. And this happened by something called the conveyor belt. So basically, the conveyor belt is a bunch of currents, both at the surface and in depth, that are interconnecting, allowing us to have all the information that happens in one area affecting other latitudes. And in case you don't believe me fully of this, roughly 20 years ago, there was this movie called The Day After Tomorrow, where basically they were represented what would happen in New York if the conveyor belt would fully stop. But maybe you are also wondering how this will affect Australia. Well, actually, also the Southern Ocean will affect the weather here. If you guys watch the news and like wa uh, watching all the weather forecasts pre presented in the news, sometimes you will see that when uh, Melbourne gets a, a little bit colder is because we it gets some cold air masses coming from Antarctica. So now we see that we can be affected both locally and internationally by what happens in the Southern Ocean. So the scientific community has been really interested in uh, trying to find out why we are getting a warmer Southern Ocean in the models. And the reason is because of the cloud representation. So we have so many different types of clouds out there and it's really difficult to represent each of them. So in the latest generation of climate models, the scientific community took really great efforts into improving better these clouds, but still low-level clouds have a little bit of issues. We also found that in the Southern Ocean, there are no comprehensive studies of those cloud and precipitation processes upon weather and patterns. So again, when you go and watch the news and see the weather forecast, you might see a picture like what I'm showing here when you'll see different precipitation patterns showing different features, where, for example, we'll get this precipitation in form of a band that is called a front, and that front can come from cold air masses or from warm air masses, and also different precipitation processes happening before and after the front. Also, sometimes you will hear about, uh, in the news, something called low pressure system, high pressure systems that are represented with this L and H, and they will also have different precipitations associated with the low pressures or a little bit more clear skies with the high pressures. So what I did in my research was to analyze uh, all of these conditions and how clouds could be represented or which characteristics we, should, we could find upon these weather patterns. So for that, I took a rich set of datasets. This plot is summarizing all the type of information that we can get from, uh, from the atmosphere. And the ones that I use more specifically are all of these. So I took field campaigns, both aircraft base and uh, ship base. I also took satellite information to represent the cloud with Himawari 8, the precipitation processes with the product of iMERGE. And I also use something that is called reanalysis. Reanalysis are basically those models that use all those equations and to some extent they will include these measurements for representation. And I also use just simply models uh, just to be based on the um, equations. 
So there was a previous student that what he did was take all that sounding information from those field campaigns to analyze what common characteristics we can find on the soundings. In case you have never heard about what a sounding is, or it's not that I'm showing here, is basically a near balloon that is launched, and among other uh, variables, it will measure the temperature. So for the rest of the presentation, you will sometimes hear me saying that the temperature profile will be the thermodynamic structure. And one of the advantages by using these soundings is that we, uh, we can get like the profile of the temperature in, with altitude, and this can be translated into clouds. So then we can know where the clouds are located and even how deep they are. So what this a student did was take all those soundings and group them by common characteristics coming with these seven uh, conditions, where basically they are representing those conditions that I was talking earlier with the different features that we have. And as a plus, with, I suppose, with uh, traditional methods, they were also representing the height latitudes. Don't worry too much about the names, the technical parts, or the nomenclature, just keep in mind that each of these numbers will represent a different free feature like what we, I was showing here earlier. So what I did in my research was to go and take the radar information that was on board the ship's uh, measurements. A radar, basically what it does is that emits a wave at a certain wavelength, and then it goes back, and that can be translated into the amount of particles that we have in the clouds, or if we, uh, uh, or if we emit a different cloud, the amount of precipitation that we have. So I concentrated on the ones that would only detect the one uh, with clouds, and basically what I did was to take all that radar information and analyze it by those uh, different uh, synoptic patterns that we found with these uh, soundings. And here I'm just summarizing those cloud features that we found by each of those seven uh, patterns. And um, just uh, I simplify and don't talk about too much with reflectivities and, com and complex words, just keep in mind that whatever is left to the pink line is uh, clouds that are not precipitating and whatever is right to the pink line are clouds that are precipitating. Here I'm just showing uh, by temperature, I also did it by altitude, but to some extent temperature can mean uh, altitude as well. So the, the colder they are, the higher the, cl the clouds are, and the warmer they are, the lower they are. And we could find that actually those clouds will present different features depending on those synoptic patterns. So next we were wondering what you end users of precipitation um, can be benefit by identifying these different characteristics. Because sometimes we just have to work with what we have. So it could happen that someone in agriculture needs to do their planning for the upcoming three years or so, something like that, and they would use the precipitation products that are out there. So we wanted to see how well and how about they are doing over the Southern Ocean. So again, we, go, we went and took that reanalysis of uh, precipitation that is here presented in blue. In red, the, the satellite with iMERGE precipitations, and in green, something that is called this distrometer, that is basically an instrument used to uh, uh, calculate the precipitation. And this distrometer was also on board those ship measure, uh, measurements that I was taking. So here I'm just showing the total accumulated precipitation upon those seven synoptic patterns. So basically just saying, um, if we always have those frontal conditions, how much we would expect to precipitate. And here we can say that with the satellites, it could do a better or worse depending on the weather patterns. But with the reanalysis, they seem to be better. But be careful, because the reason why they are uh, doing these uh, bulk statistics uh, quite well is because they tend to precipitate too frequent and not enough amount of precipitation. So it's kind of like they're doing uh, the right final answer, but not for the right reasons. So finally, we decided to go to with those low-level clouds, because the latest generation of models are still struggling with them. We took as a case study conditions with those level clouds where we wouldn't have the influence of cloud, clouds higher up. And we wanted to see if we actually could find some differences when they are a little bit more clustered together or more uh, spread out. So um, in other words, 
when we have a little bit more of clear sky conditions between them, if they will have different processes as when they are a little bit closer. And we were able to identify that when they are a, more spread out, they have a higher production of ice than when they are closer to them. And here I'm just showing an example of the ice uh, shapes that we can find in those low level clouds. So with my research, we were able to better understand cloud and precipitation processes over the Southern Ocean, but there is kind of like a catch, and one of the things is the data availability. So we're uh, relying our research mostly on ship base, and this won't be representative of the full area, only on the track that they are measuring. So here, just to visualize uh, an example, I'm just showing the weather stations that we can have worldwide, and we see that they are mostly concentrated in the northern Northern Hemisphere and in the ocean areas as well. And the Southern Hemisphere is basically um, almost empty. So we need more measurements to have a more comprehensive um, analysis of our results, as well as other seasons, because all the ships that we have were mostly concentrated in summer. So now you, you probably are wondering how these results can actually improve our uh, climate uh, projections. And what I like to think of my research is that it's another brick in the wall. So basically, I'm just pr uh, providing the information for satellite and model developers to identify exactly which areas we need to work more on to improve those representations. So eventually, those end users can also improve their products that they are providing, such as um, risk assessment, uh, agriculture planning, and climate change projections. Thank you.